members, the next item of business are motions to approve two statutory rules which relate to the health protection regulations. There will be a single debate on both motions. I will ask the chair, the clerk, to read the first motion and then call on the minister to move it. The minister will then commence the debate on both motions as listed on the ordered paper. When all who wish to speak have done so, I will then put the question on the first motion. The second motion will then be read into the record and I will call the minister to move it. The question will then be put on that motion. If that is clear, we will proceed. I will ask you now to please read uh, the, uh, motion, the first motion. <coughs> That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 17, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. And I call on the Minister of Health to move the motion. Moved. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate. And I call on the Minister to open the debate on the two motions. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And before I do that, uh, could I just have the indulgence of the House just to provide a, a, a quick update. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, since um, my earlier statement today, I have received an update from our Chief Medical Officer uh, to alert me that uh, he has been made aware of a variant of SARS-CoV-2 uh, that has recently been identified through genomic, genomic sequencing in England. And while the significance of this is currently being assessed, the UK authorities have provided an early alert to the relevant World Health Organization and European surveillance bodies. This variant um, has been identified in the UK and is believed to be causing the faster spread in the southeast of England. And my colleague Matt Hancock has provided an update to the House of Commons. As spread is growing faster than the existing variant, uh, with currently over a thousand cases. However, Mr Hancock has reassured the House of Commons there is currently nothing to suggest this variant is more likely to cause serious symptoms, and he has added that it is highly unlikely that it won't respond uh, to a vaccine. vaccine. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have directed my officials uh, to urgently ascertain uh, during the sequencing, uh, genomic sequencing of samples that has been ongo ongoing of Northern Ireland samples over the last number of months if this variant at any time has been detected in Northern Ireland. And as soon as I receive information on that, I will update the House. Mr Deputy Speaker, moving on to the motion in today's debate. Uh, the regulations under consideration here today are the restrictions amendment number 17 and number 18 regulation. These regula regulations constitute the circuit break restrictions announced on the 19th of November and introduced for a two-week period from the 27th of November to the 10th of December. The number 17 regulations were made on the 26th of November to come into effect on the 27th of November, and the number 18 regulations were made the following day to come into effect immediately. These restrictions were brought in after modelling indicated that uh, doing so offered a greater likelihood of avoiding further restrictions before Christmas. The Executive had been advised that without such an intervention, hospitals risked being overwhelmed. In the week preceding the decision on the 17th of November, the number of cases had stabilised with only a very slow decline. The R number for cases was around one at that point. Hospital emissions had continued to decline slowly over the previous week, but remained at a relatively high level and had not decreased as quickly as hoped at the outset of the period of restriction. COVID hospital inpatient numbers have fallen even more slowly than admissions and remained at a high level. This was currently a major concern in terms of hospital capacity. At that point, hospital occupancy stood at 100 per cent. 76 people had lost their lives to COVID-19 in the preceding week. In these circumstances, the Executive agreed to put in place the most extensive number of restrictions since the spring. These regulations were designed to be a short, sharp circuit breaker to reset and drive down infection rates. They were accompanied by the message to stay at home, work from home if at all possible, and otherwise only leave for essential purposes such as education, healthcare needs, to care for others, or outdoor exercise. The restriction number 18 regulations were made the following day to address two specific issues within the number 17 regulations, which then needed to be amended. 
Um, as you will be aware, Mr Deputy Speaker, the active period for these regulations has come to an end. Uh, they were only intended to be in place for a fortnight, and this period ended at midnight last Thursday night. We believe that the restrictions have had some effect and have slowed down the spread of the virus, which would not have been the case if they had not been in place. We also know, however, that we are far from being in the clear. As I have said already over the past few days, the virus is still circulating in our community and is still claiming lives. If there is a, a festive free-for-all with public health advice ignored, then it will cost lives and place unbearable pressure on our hospitals, and we must avoid these catastrophic consequences. We have to keep doing the basics, reducing our contacts, keeping our distance from others, wearing a face covering and washing our hands. And if you experience any symptoms at all, you need to isolate yourself immediately and seek a test. We are depending on everyone to act responsibly and thoughtfully in the realm of their own lives. Now that two-week restrictions have come to an end, the infection rate and our return to normal life and activities depends absolutely on the behaviour of every single one of us. Mr Deputy Speaker, I beg to move. <coughs> I now call the Chair of the Health Committee, Colin Gildon. And just to acknowledge the seriousness of what the Minister has said, um, and it is a concern given where we are currently with, with the levels of spread, but also, and I note the Minister said that uh, it was hoped that it would respond to a vaccine, but I'm just not clear if that's the vaccine that is currently um, available. So these are very worrying times, and just to Reiterate the message to the public at large to do everything you can personally to protect yourself and others by uh, reducing your contacts at this time. Yes. The member has raised a very valid point, and at a point that I'm sure has occurred to other members that they were listening to the Minister's speech. It would have been very helpful had the Minister indicated whether this variant, which is quite worrying, can be dealt with effectively by the vaccine that is now available at the moment rather than having to wait perhaps for a further vaccine to deal with it. Um, and I didn't quite detect from him that he gave a clear indication that, that was the case. Yep, go ahead, Minister. To, to, to bring, um, I suppose, some clarity to that point um, for the House, uh, the information this variant has been brought to light uh, today in regards to its seriousness, uh, down, put down uh, the military labs where most of the, of the activity in regards to this virus has currently been ascertained. It is now working to see if the current virus uh, will respond and will be dealt with with the vaccine that currently is on offer. At this minute in time, there is nothing to say that it wouldn't, uh, because it is a variant of the original SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So that work is currently ongoing as we speak. And again, as soon as I receive an update on that, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will update the House as well. Um, and if I just may briefly, uh, Deputy Speaker, just um, and he normally is not in, in his place today, but normally Colin McGrath would be here and just as chair of the health committee to acknowledge the work that Colin has done on the health committee through a very intensive time and a lot of intensive work, um, and to thank him for that, and also to welcome Chiara Hunter to the committee and look forward to working with Chiara. So, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Health Committee was briefed on these regulations on Thursday, 10 December. The Committee is conscious of the significant restrictions on people's freedoms imposed under the two-week circuit breaker, but also of the persistently high levels of infection in the community and the continuing pressure on our hospitals and health and social care workers who are facing into a very dark winter after the most arduous year any of us have probably ever seen. Yep, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank the member for giving way. Would you agree with me that the uh, increased or the, the high levels of transmission of the virus are very worrying uh, and that restrictions such as these are aimed at lowering the transmission of the virus, but it doesn't seem to be happening? And even at the minute, the rates of transmission here in the north are more than four times what they are in the south. So it suggests that we are doing something wrong up here. Would you agree with that? Thank the member for his intervention. And I have to agree, the figures are certainly worrying. And there are, there are, um, there are certainly um, differences between the, the rates here and in the south. And I would urge that the maximum cooperation is undertaken 
as a matter of urgency in relation to testing, tracing, communication of messaging, all of that on a north-south basis, but also the continued high level of transmission is a concern as we, as we face into Christmas. Um, the committee raised the monitoring of effectiveness of measures and again placed on record its concern about the process for doing that. In relation to monitoring, members acknowledged that transmission rates appeared stubborn and it was suggested that monitoring of the effectiveness of the restrictions on each sector is therefore important. Official advised that the imposition of restrictions on a particular sector did not necessarily imply evidence of impact on that sector and that it is difficult to disaggregate the net effects beyond confirming that the evidence shows transmission is higher anywhere where people congregate in enclosed spaces. The timely communication of frequently changing rules to enforcement bodies was also raised. The committee was advised that for main sets of amendments, extensive engagement is undertaken in advance of regulations being made, but the official conceded that where small adjustments are made to rules, such as in Amendment 18, perhaps where the work is required to update the police and others. It was also confirmed that enforcement powers are in place from the time that the rules have effect. Thus, can call you, the Committee's concerns centre on matters outside the particulars of these regulations, and we are continuing to press for further, better and more timely engagement on policy development ahead of the making of further regulations. In closing, I would remind those listening once again to please consider the pressure on our health and social care workers as they try to stretch yet again their reserves of strength and resilience for the winter months before the vaccinations take effect. I urge everyone, let's not waste the efforts of this year. Limit your social contact, keep your distance, wear a face covering, and keep washing your hands. Cormie Agat. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, just at the outset, um, could I um, thank the, the Minister for his commentary on uh, this new piece of information that we have uh, this afternoon on the um, new variant of COVID-19 that the UK has now announced, and I suppose it, it, it does really, um, does really uh, show the importance of our systems and the adequacy of our um, test, trace and protect system, that it should be able to cope with this new variant going forward. I think that's really vital that that, that is uh, working well and that we will be able to track this uh, undoubtedly if it's reached UK shores it most probably is here in Northern Ireland as well so it's also critical that um, this assembly is kept informed so we thank the Minister for that commitment to do that in terms of this new variant and um, also it's critical that the vaccine rollout does happen as quickly as physically possible in order to protect our most vulnerable. So, Mr Speaker, at the outset I just wanted to put on record um, my sympathy to those families who have lost a precious family member in this last week since we last discussed these health protection regulations. I think we all need to bear in mind that our individual actions over the next few weeks can and will have an impact on how many of our elderly population will be here to receive this much anticipated COVID-19 vaccine. Hearing of vaccine deliveries into Northern Ireland over the weekend is fantastic news and news that it is right to feel a certain amount of relief and right that we can all look forward with optimism to 2021. Mr Speaker, we do however need to act with much caution in the coming weeks in particular, ensuring that we continue to protect those who are most at risk. Let's give them the time that they need to have this vaccine and gain that much needed protection that only the vaccine can give. It is only natural that we are now very much focused on the next couple of weeks and the opportunity to live in a less restricted way over the Christmas period, while the freedom being offered to people is welcome after the restrictions of the last nine months. The message must be one of caution, particularly as we consider the case numbers in the last week. The rules and guidelines continue to be very unwelcome intrusion on our freedom, but they are necessary and we must all keep those basic measures of protection to the forefront of our minds and, to our, and of our actions. Washing those hands very regularly, avoid touching the face, using a face covering, keep that social distance from others, which includes family and friends that do not live, do not live with you or share your home with you. Mr Speaker, it is while considering those case numbers from last week, that I think we reflect on the regulations before us today, particularly Amendment Number 17, giving effect to the circuit breaker as agreed by the Executive on the 19th and 24th of November. These regulations asked a lot of people. They asked a lot of our business community. 
they ask a lot of our churches. They ask a lot of those involved in sport and many social activities we all long to see back up and running in our communities. But Mr Speaker, these measures as set out before us in the regulation are necessary. The R number has shown an upward trend, yet it has been uh, admitted by our health advisors these measures did not have the level of effect sought to drive down R. I think that poses questions for those advising the executive, and it highlights the need to study the, uh, the, um, the reaction to each of the restrictions. And we need that evidence. Whether the price that is being paid by those restrictions um, we target is actually worth. Uh, this needs to be considered as we look um, to find a balanced and proportionate way through what might come in January. But we do need to reflect that those businesses and activities so hugely impacted by the restrictions did not contribute to the case numbers that we see today. And understandably, whether it be our hospitality sector or churches, they're asking why us when we understand that. Mr Speaker, on the issue of churches, while acknowledging that some congregations have had clusters, I do think it is right that we recognise that the closure of churches is a significant ask of our faith community. Again, we need to look at how we can work with churches to allow worship to continue in the coming weeks and months. While the regulation does make a necessary adjustment for those congregations hosting online services, and that is welcome, we want to see our churches open. We need partnerships as we tackle COVID-19, and I do think it is right that we place on record our thanks to local councils for working collaboratively with the executive. The additional regulation does grant enforcement powers to our councils in a range of areas, and their support in this is welcome. However, enforcement does need to be done fairly and in an even-handed way across Northern Ireland, and I trust that the councils are working through SOLAS, for example, to ensure that, that is the case. We have seen in recent days how damaging it is to public acceptance of these regulations when some, including some of those sitting across the chamber today, continue to escape questioning and being held to account for breaching regulations and causing so much damage to our public health messaging and its effectiveness. No one is above these laws. We need that message to be very loud and clear. I just at this point want to put on record in, in summing up my party's appreciation to all of our incredible healthcare workers and in the, the wonderful way that they have uh, played a part through this pandemic and this what has been a terribly challenging year for everyone. So thank you Mr Speaker. Uh, we support the motions before the House today. I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and I'd like to thank the Minister and other members here today for their welcome uh, as I become part of the, the Health Committee, and I look forward to working with them all. Uh, I welcome the opportunity today to speak on, the, on these uh, health protection regulations as I have previously. As I reflected last week in my remarks, this has been an extremely difficult year, changing all aspects of our daily lives and bringing great hardship and grief to many. I continue to be mindful of the emotional and mental health impact which the pandemic and isolation has had on our society, and indeed the long-term impact which I think we would acknowledge uh, it will have in the months and years that lie ahead. In line with Amendment No. 17, it is evident those businesses in the hospitality, close contact and leisure services have been hit particularly bad as a result of COVID-19. I am sure that it is the same right across this House, that there is not one day that we do not hear from many business owners and staff from businesses about the impact of COVID-19. I welcome that the current restric restrictions, and particularly in the run-up to the Christmas period, now that more people are allowed to attend places of worship, in line with, in, in line with Amendment No. 18. However, I know, and it has been echoed uh, by yourself before me, uh, church closures have been very difficult, especially for many of my constituents. I think even more so in this time of great turmoil when perhaps people are more in need than ever of a place to practice their spiritual beliefs. I hope that the recording of live streaming of services uh, was somewhat of a comfort to some and has enabled thousands of people across the North to have the comfort of their faith during this difficult time. However, I must say, Mr Speaker, that I also regret that uh, has been said by colleagues before me here today that it is deeply regrettable um, that the these issues uh, are only be being debated today in the Assembly. Dealing and managing the pandemic is and has been our most important item of business this year, and as such, I feel strongly that proper opportunities to debate the regulations which touch on almost every aspect of our lives and our constituents' lives must be given to this Assembly. 
Whilst news of the vaccination and its rollout over the last week has given us all hope that 2021 will be a much better year for us all, and we hope that we will not see a surge in COVID-19 cases in the coming weeks, we also acknowledge that the weeks and months ahead may, may be just as difficult as those that have just gone, and that ongoing and further restrictions may very well, unfortunately, be required. I hope that any new regulations in the weeks ahead see MLAs debate them in advance of their implementation and allow us the opportunity to reflect the views, worries and concerns of all our constituents that lockdown rightly raises. The approach over the last month has seen many businesses have to shut their doors only to be allowed for them to open for one week and then close for an additional two weeks. In addition to the financial hardship that this entails, I am also deeply concerned about the mixed message which this approach gives to dealing with the virus as it, give, as it gives to the wider public. I believe that a more consistent approach would resonate more strongly with the public and make clearer what is required of us all to beat this virus. To conclude, Mr Speaker, I and my party colleagues are supportive of the health protection regulations and fully recognise the need for them. However, we also strongly feel that more debate and scrutiny be allowed in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise on behalf of the Alliance Party to support the amendments. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the amendments, particularly in number 17, bringing into law a circuit breaker, had very far-reaching consequences for our non-essential retailers, bars, restaurants, gyms, sports clubs and places of worship during what should have been a very important time for their operations. The only glimmer of normality for many of them was the ability to continue to provide carryouts, click and collect and to move their services online. On Saturday, I visited a florist in South Belfast to see how the restrictions had impacted their business, and I was pleased to learn that their experience had been somewhat positive and that their trade had actually increased due to the ability to click and collect and with a greater sense of support from the local community. I sincerely hope that this is replicated across the entire small business sector over the next few weeks and going into the new year. Another observation I made was that it was fairly easy for social distancing restrictions to be introduced and, importantly, that customers were happy to queue accordingly while I was there. It is regrettable, therefore, that we witnessed once again, also on Saturday, images on social media of huge queues outside a large clothing retailer. And so I repeat that it would be prudent for the regulations relating to the wearing of face masks be introduced on a more universal basis. It is essential that retailers are required to enforce social distancing outside their premises as well. To not do so is to allow other retailers to lose out on customers avoiding the area for fear of community transmission. A point I made at the Health Committee that the um, Chair referenced there around the small adjustment um, related to Amendment 18 and the removal of sports massage from close contact services. I welcome this amendment as it allowed for those who require physiotherapy to be able to receive it at the earliest opportunity. And it was and so it was unfortunate that a constituent of mine did not feel that the change was properly communicated and she felt that she was going to fall foul of the PSNI after some engagement with them if she operated within the two weeks. Therefore, I repeat that the communication around the, this amendment and others going forward needs to be better. Again, going forward, I sincerely hope that those businesses and non-essential retailers who have been affected by this um, circuit breaker received the financial support that they were promised as soon as possible. And I was quite amazed earlier but, uh, during question time when the finance minister didn't seem to grasp how, how many businesses have lost out, um, haven't received communication or in the middle of an appeal under the local restrictions support scheme. And I would support Mr Beggs' call and others previously for a dedicated phone line for elected representatives. Um, because as I have no doubt that um, every other member in this chamber continue to be contacted by desperate business owners, as I say, have, ha haven't heard back about their claim, or worse, they have been advised that, that they were not eligible when they blatantly met the stated criteria. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is unfair to force these businesses to close and then de deny them support, and I sincerely hope, again, going forward, that things are done better for them and their staff. In closing, I would like to send a happy Christmas to all those health and social care workers who have battled this virus so valiantly this year. I sincerely hope that they can all have some time to spend with their family and recuperate from an exhausting year. And finally, I send my deepest sympathies to everyone who has been bereaved this year. We all lament that they lost their loved ones before the vaccine programme was in place. Thank you. I call Colin McGrath. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And as ever, I welcome the opportunity to speak on and debate the efficiency of our current regulations and restrictions. Uh, once again, the regulations that we are discussing date back to November and are no longer currently, uh, they don't apply. And perhaps it is because uh, Christmas is approaching, but I can't help but think that our current way of implementing these restrictions is a little bit like the hokey cokey. We are in lockdown, then we are not, then we are in, then we are out. And then to complete it and to complete the dance, we have certain parties turning around on their approach to the regulations and the restrictions. But unlike the song, that isn't what it's all about. What this is about is about saving lives and relieving the pressure on our health system and those heroes in our health sector. At this time, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I want to pay tribute to those heroes who consistently go over and above the call of duty to save lives and ensure that families do not suffer the devastating loss of a loved one to this most unforgiving and indiscriminate disease. Just last week, I called for a one-off payment of £500 to be paid to our health, care, uh, our health and care sector staff. These heroes have gone the extra mile for us over the last nine months, missing precious time with their family, changing in car parks, not getting breaks or times, time off. And I think that that would be a small payment to recognise uh, what the sacrifice that they have made for us and that that is not beyond the reach of our executive. This week they will go forward and implement a vaccination rollout that offers much needed hope uh, and light in the darkness. The amendments that we debate today, number 17 concerns restrictions on sporting events, close contact services and leisure venues, non-essential businesses, licensed premises, places of worship and hospitality. Number 18 concerns the number of people able to be present to live stream a church service. We are being asked to debate and ratify these regulations and restrictions, but why do we continue to delay them and debate them after they have lapsed? I could, at a push, understand the 28-day uh, delay for regulations that continue to be implemented, but to debate and ratify something that has lapsed is farcical. Why must this Assembly continually be playing catch-up? If we look at the way of doing business in the South, we saw them enter a six-week intensive lockdown, which we supported and wanted to see emulated here. And now the numbers of those contracting the virus in the South is reducing significantly. This was a course of action that was not easy for them, but it worked. Meanwhile, here in the North, we go into a four-week lockdown then something resembling a reopening, then a further two-week lockdown, and here we are getting ready for the next week, which we will see a further loosening of restrictions. On and on it goes, like a never-ending hokey-cokey. There must be a better and more efficient way of doing things. I do appreciate that our Health Minister is doing the best that he can with what he can, and I will continue to support him in that work. However, last week he refused to answer whether or not he felt schools should be closing at this time as that was of a different department. And it is that silo mentality that I think we need to move beyond. The ratification of these regulations and restrictions will have its own ripple effect and the restrictions that we place in one department will have effects on other departments as well. I should also make clear at this point that the actions we take this week will have their own direct and indirect effect. But be under no illusion, next week is not a free-for-all. To treat it as such is a slap in the face to our healthcare heroes. That household gatherings which breach the rules, if only in a minimal way, such as an extra household slipping in to breach the three-house-only rule, will have its own indirect consequences for a nurse unable to take leave and having to go outside to their car for a cup of tea during a night shift. Yes, Mr Deputy Speaker, we owe our healthcare staff much more. Let's at least give them a fighting chance at combating this invisible enemy and the conditions under which to do so. People need to think about these effects and consequences when they gather together next week. So in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, let me re reiterate that I support the amendments here today and I continue to support our Health Minister. However, that support is in no way blinkered. My support for these health amendments and for the Health Minister is very much tied to the way that business is done here. 
And as we approach Christmas and the new year, let's stop playing catch up and let's actually take the lead in debating and implementing these regulations. Mr Deputy Speaker, I support the motions and the amendments. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have received uh, very serious news today uh, from the Health Minister about this new variant of the virus. And uh, just at a time when we were all quietly celebrating the fact that we felt that we could see the light uh, at the end of the tunnel. And just at that point, this new challenge comes along. So let's hope that the current vaccine does prove uh, to be able uh, to deal with it. The BBC Spotlight recently did a program that compared the success of Wales, uh, particularly the different track and trace procedures that they had in place, and their efforts were certainly very impressive. But yet, over the weekend, we've just heard the, the news, and it's bad news, that the transmission of the virus has, has went through the roof in Wales. Now, it's easy when this happens to look for reasons to want to find somebody to point the finger of blame at. But the reason it happens is because people have let their guard down and they have facilitated the uh, transmission uh, of this virus. Now, our executive have granted relaxation uh, in social gatherings over Christmas. And it will be a temptation to say thank you very much and take advantage of the relaxations or indeed, it might even be tempting for people to try and stretch them a little bit further to suit their own circumstances. And I would say to anyone planning to take this approach, you do so at your own peril. And if ever there was a time to raise our guard, it is now in the coming few weeks. We owe it to our families, we owe it to our neighbours, to our workmates, and to all our fellow, fellow citizens to keep that guard up. In relation to these regulations, I, along with I'm sure everybody else sitting in the House today, have received numerous emails from different organisations affected by the relaxations, indoor sports clubs, swimming, all sorts of activities, uh, telling us that they have put fantastic uh, things in place to prevent the transmission of the, the virus and could we lobby uh, to allow them uh, to reopen. But the reality is that there's absolutely no safe way or absolute way to avoid transmission of this virus in a situation where people gather and just one little slip could lead to a death. My family have made decisions that are quite frankly heartbreaking at a time of the year when we all love to get together. And I would appeal to everyone to make sacrifices over Christmas. It is the right thing to do. And it is in keeping with the Christian message that let's not forget Christmas is all about. We will beat this virus, but we all have to do the right thing. And if we do the right thing, it, this will happen sooner rather then later. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and yeah, I have to agree with some of the other speakers. I mean, here we are again, and this assembly is in the position of debating and voting on regulations for the first time after the period in which they even applied. We're 10 months into this pandemic. And we should not be in this position, fumbling our way from one set of restrictions to the next uh, with no overarching plan or strategy. And we keep being told that we can't have endless cycles of, of lockdowns, yet here we are in another endless cycle of lockdowns. And speculation already starting among the general public about when the dates for the next lockdown have been agreed. Now, of course, we must follow the science and the public health guidance. And if that dictates restrictive measures to deal with the virus, that is absolutely understandable, and everyone needs to get behind that. 
But the problem here is that this executive doesn't seem to have a plan that extends beyond a week or two, and that's at the very best. There's no strategy in place for when one set of restrictions are easing and what that means. No forward planning, no guidance sitting there ready to go and let people know what it means. Amendment 17, these restrictions only came in after we had another shambolic display of decision making from the executive. So I need to put on record the confidence in this executive with the general public and its ability to deal with this pandemic is absolutely decimated. How do we expect the public to adhere to the public health regulations with the confusion and mixed messaging that has been happening? I mean, we're here debating and approving a set of red, uh, restrictions that don't even apply anymore. Any wonder people are confused? And we had the shock of a cross-community veto being used against proposals from the health minister to deal with the crisis. And then we had some businesses even being allowed to open up for one week and then being closed down. We're told essential retail only, but since when was buying a flat pack coffee table or a fancy vase more essential than children's clothing? Like everyone, I have businesses contacting me in a flurry when these restrictions are announced. But as an MLA, my source of information was just as good as theirs. I looked to Twitter. I looked to journalists' news feeds. Time and time again, we have put businesses in an impossible situations. One business owner phoned my office, very confused, as they were clear that they were not essential. They had not intended to remain open. They had everything in line to close down um, with what they believed was the public health guidance, and then found out that no, but because they sold hardware, they were now classed as essential. And if they did go ahead and close as planned, that they would be deemed as taking that as their own choice and wouldn't be eligible, eligible for financial support. I note that again, the regulations and guidance that were due to come into effect on Friday past were published at the 11th hour again. So much from the promises from this executive that they wouldn't make decisions without giving people notice. Hours before some businesses were due to open up, they learned that they couldn't in fact even do so. How is that acceptable to anyone? And all of this, while we are still seeing worrying levels of community transition, transmission and too many people still losing their lives to this virus, this is an unprecedented situation. But unfortunately, this executive's inability to deal with the crisis in a timely manner has now become very much the precedence. So we do have hope on the horizon with the vaccine, but it remains to be seen if we have any sort of plan to get us to the point where immunity from the vaccine is widespread enough. So I can't, like others, welcome the opportunity to discuss these regulations today. They've passed, they've gone. <laughs> so does it even matter if I give support or if anybody here gives support? They're done, they're dusted. But I do welcome the chance of hearing from this minister the detail of what lays ahead of us what are the predictions for COVID over Christmas? Is the 4th of January the date being earmarked as the next lockdown? Will the NHS make it to then? Are plans in place for restrictions before, after or during Christmas if needed? And will we have to turn the journalist Twitter newsfeed to find out? Will this house be respected enough to be told? I certainly would, yeah. Um, the member, uh, and like Mr Chambers, has made some very, very, um, very, very useful points. It may be that when the decisions that she's requesting are made, we'll be in recess. And I think it is important that the Minister takes this, what could be the last opportunity, to let us know what the current thinking from the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer is on these issues. This date uh, of early January has been suggested by many media com commentators as being the likely date where a yet another lockdown will be uh, implemented. I have many businesses that are saying to me, it is not worth our wide opening. Our Christmas trade has been utterly destroyed. 
But unfortunately, uh, and sadly, they have not been allowed to, comp to claim compensation because they are not deemed to be requiring to close. Can the Minister, in his summation, tell us very clearly what is going to happen in the first week of January so we have clarity? Is there going to be a lockdown? Is that the latest thinking? I thank the member for his intervention, and that is exactly what this House needs to hear. Tomorrow will be the last plenary day before the new year, and yet again we know nothing. So I would really welcome that from the Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise once again, as I have done over the last uh, number of weeks, to speak to the absolute absurdity of the situation that we are in today. And as of last week, we have seen new regulations that have reopened large numbers uh, of workplaces and sectors of society uh, come into effect, as others have mentioned and alluded to. Yet this Assembly still has not even discussed it, never mind voted on it. This in itself is very worrying and continues to set a dangerous precedent, which effectively says uh, that the Executive and its Ministers will act. And if you are not in the club, tough luck, your voice will not be heard in any real meaningful sense. What kind of way is this to run a political institution? Where is the democracy and the accountability here? And obviously, we are discussing Amendments 17 and 18 today. Uh, but when will we have time to discuss the current regulations that are in place and, and their effects? Presumably, it is the middle of next month, when the regulations will be in, in place for the guts uh, of a month. And hopefully not, but by all accounts, we are likely to be in a scenario, as many health experts are warning, that there will be an increase in cases and infections and likely deaths resulting from that. Mr. Speaker, one, Mr. Deputy Speaker, one key theme, key theme throughout this crisis has been an attempt at victim blaming from a political establishment, which itself is responsible for presiding over the spread of this virus. And it is my contention that the executive is primarily responsible for the surge of the virus. And broadly speaking, it had two major opportunities to combat the virus. Initially in March, when we learned uh, when it arrived on our shores, and then later in the summer after the first. Uh, major lockdown, and the executive wasted these opportunities. Uh, and it's dangerous following uh, the, the pursuit of the Tories, its commitment to a for-profit model of society and the economy, and its refusal to properly implement a, a zero COVID strategy. And now, executive ministers, Mr. Deputy Speaker, appear to be clamouring uh, to cover their own mistakes by blaming individuals for their actions, while ignoring the policy decisions and wider structural obstacles that have prevented us from beating this virus, such as the disastrous track and trace system and the shambolic mismanagement of restrictions. The big parties are now lining up to blame uh, another surge on ordinary people mixing over the Christmas period. You can see the, the, uh, the blame starting already. But that isn't good enough, Mr Deputy Speaker, because the daily context that we are entering is one that they have created. Consider this, as restrictions were eased last week, uh, we haven't still discussed them, like I said. Uh, COVID cases per 100,000 of the population were at a significant high compared to previous weeks indicating that the executive's pre-Christmas circuit breaker was an abject failure by all accounts, as some of us predicted it uh, would be, uh, and further indicating that the Christmas period uh, will likely be followed by another period of restrictions that others have alluded to because of the precise failure to get the virus to manageable levels. And all of this was utterly predictable. And the executive was war warned about such a scenario. They were warned by Gabriel Scali, who said that reopening over December would mean that, and I quote, in January and February we may well be burying relations. What shocking stuff. Uh, and I know some MLAs uh, are fond of quoting uh, Mr Scally normally or sometimes after the fact, but they seem incapable uh, of following his advice and now when it matters. So if there is a spike, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the early parts of next year, then it isn't good enough for the executive or ministers to blame it on people visiting their family over Christmas, not when they themselves have permitted such action. Um, after opening and reopening workplaces, causing surges after presiding over another failed circuit breaker, after throwing workers and businesses under the bus, if executive ministers want someone to blame for the next surge, I suggest they look in the mirror. Uh, the executive have presided over an omni shambles, including how quickly it has lifted restrictions in the summer, how it danced along to the tune of the Tories most of the way throughout this pandemic, the fact that there has been mixed messaging, confused messaging, and downright baffling and the scientific messaging is not the fault of the public, it is the fault of executive ministers in this building. So the so-called circuit breaker that ended last week has been an unmitigated disaster and a failure in health terms, as well as seeing more job losses because of the 
uncertainty caused, the stop-start attitude towards restrictions, and the inability to properly track, trace, and control the virus to work toward creating a zero COVID situation has resulted in a disastrous situation in health and economic terms. And even when the circuit breaker was in place, like I said, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the rate of infections uh, were shooting up. And rather than taking stock of the situation, rather than slowing down and saying, let's look at this and respond accordingly, as other countries have done, the executive has opened up the shutters to this virus. What disgraceful stuff. And the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and again uh, and expecting different results, as one scientist. This, Mr. Einstein said many years ago, I suggest there isn't many Einsteins in the storm and executive currently. And in the absence of any lead from the executive, people have been again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, forced to act for themselves, including some bar owners who are able to close uh, over the Christmas period, or they're doing so for, for health and safety reasons. Some pr I will go away, yeah. I thank the member for giving way. He seems to paint a picture of a utopia where by government close the entire country down and therefore keeping infection rates under control, while not mentioning the need for personal responsibility. Could I ask him under his scenario, if the government followed an approach where a lockdown would, lock, would close the entire country and people didn't follow personal responsibility, what then? Um. I say to the member, it's not utopia. I'll give him two words. It's called New Zealand. There's an example there that could have been followed and wasn't followed. But also, he claims to be against the strategy of uh, in and out of lockdown, but he's pursuing and defending the strategy, which will mean, by definition, in and out of lockdown. And he doesn't, he fails to grasp the exact point. Um, and, you know, back to my, my, my comments, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, people have been forced to act because the executive have failed uh, the act. Principals and teachers. Uh, as well, in the absence of any, any real uh, action or any action at all from the Education Minister, much like earlier this year, I have been forced to uh, close schools and protect pupils and staff. So, whilst it may be fashionable, Mr. Deputy Speaker, or easy to blame everyone else, the executive and its approach cannot be let, let off the hook, especially as we see what will happen over the next few weeks, and hopefully not. But by all accounts, there seems to be a dangerous another surge uh, on the way. Thank you. And now I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, as a number of sp uh, speakers have rightly said, there is something farcical about this debate. Here we are, a Legislative Assembly asked to approve legislation that is already dead and gone. It neither matters whether we approve it or do not approve it, and that is the very essence of the farce. Uh, these regulations could have been before us last week with the others that we debated, uh, I'm sure. Uh, the ones that are now ruling us could be before us today, I would have thought. But as someone has pointed out, uh, they will have run their course during recess and will be invited to debate them at the end of January. Um, I think that's why a debate such as this is fast raising traction. That's why there have been far less speakers on this occasion, because people recognise the futility of this particular exercise. And it does not reflect well on this House uh, and those who set the business of this House that this is the persistent arrangement that we have in respect of these uh, regulations. I will therefore keep my own remarks quite brief. There is one issue. I want to draw the Minister out on, if I can. Currently, uh, or, sorry, under these regulations, um, churches were closed. Now, there was very little indication in the public domain of scientific or other advice indicating that churches were such a problem that they had to be closed. So I do want to know why it was that a century without notice, apparently without much indication of churches being a difficulty, in the face of many indications that several churches were taking conscious, effective steps to reduce their numbers, to have the social distancing, to do all the right things, 
Nonetheless, they were visited with a punitive measure uh, which would have come if they had done nothing. So why were churches uh, closed during that two weeks? What was the advice that gave rise to that? And now when churches are reopened, they're reopened in circumstances where there's an added restriction which didn't exist before. In that, you now have to wear a mask, not just going to your seat and coming from your seat, but while you're in your seat throughout the currency of the service. Why is that? Because it's the same social distancing within the buildings that it was before. And there has been, to my knowledge, very little indication that churches have been a significant problem. So why this added, uh, uh, suddenly announced restriction? Uh, because it's one thing in terms of comfort and durability to wear a mask going in and out of a shop, going in and out of a church. Uh, it's quite another thing to be asked to wear a mask for the total duration of a, a service where one generally is not moving about. So what is the rationale and the reason for putting that punitive measure upon church goers? Uh, and I think that's something that we need to hear uh, from the minister himself. The other, only other comment I want to make is the regulations that have just passed drew their own opprobrium because, you know, in my constituency, I can think of a couple of devoted toy shops. That's all they do. They sell toys. They were forced to close. But you could buy some of the same toys in Tesco's. So why was it that there was this disparity which in fact punished the small independent trader and advantaged the large supermarkets and international traders. And I think that is something that caused a good deal of resentment, uh, particularly amongst those who had spent money, scarce resources, preparing and readying themselves only to be slapped in the face uh, with these regulations. So going forward, whatever forward entails, I do trust that the Minister and the Executive will temper these issues with a, a, degree, a greater degree of what would appear to many to be common sense than heretofore. Thank you. I now call on the Health Minister, Robin Swan, to conclude and wind up the debate on the two motions. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the members for being in attendance today. And uh, for their contributions to this debate. And I, I appreciate the willingness of the Assembly to work within what are unusual processes, uh, whereby the role of the legislative scrutiny is being applied after the event. In this case, the scrutiny takes place in respect of, of regulations that have, as many have said, already expired. Uh, nevertheless, I believe that it is important that this scrutiny takes place in order to examine and comment upon measures um, that have been taken. In regards to, to the timing of, of today's debate, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I will not defend where we are today, but I will try, uh, well, I will explain uh, from what I have of why we are debating these today. This debate has been held at the earliest opportunity available to my department. These regulations were laid before the Assembly on the 27th and 30th of November, respectively. The examiner, examiner of statutory rules uh, reported on them on the 9th of December, and the committee moved quickly to scrutinise them then on the 10th of December. So today is the first opportunity for them to deb be debated. The timing of that debate is a matter for the Assembly, um, given the Assembly's own requirements for the input of the examiner of statutory rules and the timing of the scrutiny by the Health Committee. Mr Deputy Speaker, if there is another way that these regulations can be brought forward, and debated. I'm part of that. I'm up for that because, as I said earlier, two members in this House, I think in the past nine, ten months, I've been in this chamber more uh, than any other minister of the executive. And even in an opening today's comments in regards to an update 
as to where we were seeing a variant of COVID coming forward. I brought that first to this House, not to the media, not to anywhere else, to this House to update where I think is the proper place it should be taken. So if there is another way that we can debate these regulations and have meaningful democratic input, I'm up for it. The members know that. I will. Except, as someone who sat in his chair, and could I say someone who's glad he's not sitting in your chair at the moment, and I've thought of that many, many times over the Sorry, last could I encourage the member to speak Sorry. to the microphone? Sorry about that. As someone who has sat in his chair and who's very glad that he's not sitting in this, his chair for the last month, I do accept that he has been before this Assembly far more than any minister and indeed has made himself available to the media far more than any minister. And you're to be congratulated on that. But we're going into recess. Can he guarantee us that if there's a problem arises with the vaccine and the new variant, that he will immediately issue a written statement to members to let them have an update on a very worrying situation so that we hear directly from him before the media or on Twitter or Facebook? Um, I, I, will, I will issue the written statement, as I, the member will be aware, at the end of a number of weeks on a, on a number of Fridays I had. Uh, issued written statements just to update members where we were, and I got criticised for that by members in this House as well for doing that. Uh, but I will issue, and I have issued written statements. Can I give a guarantee that it will be before media or, or Twitter finds out? I can't give that guarantee. I can't even give that guarantee sitting in an executive meeting. Uh, so I can't give it to the House. If I could give it to the member, I would. Uh, and I will update, and I, as I've said, uh, Deputy Speaker, in regards to the variant, in regards to vaccines, I'll provide current updates and regular updates, both to this House and to the, the committee as well. Um, I also think I'm, I'm due in the committee just before Christmas, and that will be my 12th uh, attendance in front of the, the committee this year as well. Um, so in regards to, to where we are in the current context, Mr Deputy Speaker, things move fast, and the observations and concerns of the Assembly members are taken on board as we develop policy and work on the next set of amendments. Um, but, but I will, uh, and I suppose to, to, to explain as well, and I have had the conversation with the Chair of, of the Committee, whose duty it is uh, to scrutinise these regulations. These regulations come forward as policy development of the Executive, uh, not solely uh, from my department, although I take great pleasure in coming here and having these debates and answering the questions that members do bring forward. And I also believe that the public must have the confidence that the Executive is not acting without scrutiny. And for that reason, I am happy to respond to a number of questions and comments raised by members um, during the debate. In regards to, to comments made by, by the Chair uh, of the Committee, and I thank them for their engagement with my officials and other officials in regards to the scrutiny of, of these regulations. Regulations. If there is another way where they be, could come earlier, uh, where we were a policy development stage, I would be supportive of that. But as, as I say, this policy is developed by the executive and not solely um, by my department. Um, I appreciate the remarks that the Minister is making about um, coming to the House and giving updates. And actually, I think nobody could fault the Minister of Health for the amount of times that he has made himself available for that. But would he accept that there are possibly two separate things that need to happen? There's updating the House and there's the scrutinising of the decisions that's taken. And the scrutinising of the decision can make its way through uh, the committee and can be scrutinised and the experts can be called in. And that does take a period of time. But the updating of the House could easily be done by a ministerial statement by any one of the ministers in this House at the next available time to which all members could come in and seek the clarity that they need. Because the clarity that is needed by members often isn't about scrutinising the impact. It's just for updates and questions that when we use the official emails can take weeks to come back where we're just looking at a quick update and that that process of updating the House versus scrutinising the actual policy could be helpful. No, I, and I agree with the member. In fact, if, if, I re, if I recall correct, and I do stand to be corrected, Mr D Deputy Speaker, when these regulations were brought in um, and announced by the Executive on the Thursday, I think it was me who came and made the statement um, on the Monday morning. Um, so, no, as I have said to the member, uh, this is the place where those questions can be asked and should be answered. Uh, moving on to the contribution from the, the Deputy Chair of the Committee, Ms. Ms Pam Cameron, in regards to an update in regards to vaccine. Um, I, I will say, and I think it was Mr Chambers said about you know, the light that this vaccine does bring, uh, 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, let us not lose the hope uh, and the positiveness that this vaccine does bring. I know we mentioned earlier on in the opening, my opening statements in regards to a new variant, but we don't know how that stands yet uh, in regards to the vaccine and how, how successful it is. But we do know that the current variant that we are battling in COVID-19 that it is effective. Um, as of close of play yesterday, we had vaccinated 1,700 uh, individuals. That included uh, vaccinators, care home residents, care home staff, and healthcare workers. So, from a stand and start of when we received uh, the go ahead for the vaccine, receiving the vaccine, uh, that programme is now well, well underway, and we've received, um, as the vice chair of the committee uh, indicated, further deliveries um, of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, over the weekend, where we now have in stock in regards to 50,000 uh, vaccines, which is enough to vaccinate 25,000 individuals with, without waste. You. Uh, thank the Minister for giving away. Minister, I think you said 1,700 vaccines uh, over roughly a seven day period. Will there be uh, an expansion, an increase in the numbers vaccinated uh, in that time period, uh, within this, uh, a week's period, uh, as we move forward? And, you know, and one of the things when we, keep, we gave the update in, the, in regards to how the vaccine programme would work uh, to the House a couple of weeks ago in the debate, we have started off by vaccinating our vaccinators. Uh, that programme actually ran over the weekend in a number of trusts, which started last week in the Belfast Trust because, again, of the, the logistical supply and management of the vaccine itself. It requires a pharmacist to be, to be in presence, actually, to, to dilute it and draw it up. So we've done that piece of work um, over the weekend in regards to other trusts, and those other trusts are now moving into care homes um, today. I spoke to the chief executive of the, the Northern Trust, who hoped to be well, had already teams out vaccinating, vaccinating care home residents and staff this afternoon. So that multiplier effect now will kick in from from today. So the member will receive, and as I've said, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm willing to provide. Uh, written updates in regards to how that is actually progressing. Part of my intention as well that it does, does become another part of the public dashboard uh, that we have uh, on display so people can see the progress that we are making. That takes time to develop and also to validate the information that, that is there. But in regards to, to other co uh, comments from um, the, the Vice Chair, and that is in regards to the value of, of our healthcare workers. And I think the member knows this well in regards to having family members who have been on the front line from the start and continue to be on the front line. And as other members have indicated, the support that we need um, to give to them. Mr Deputy Speaker, the best present we could give to any healthcare worker this Christmas is by playing our part, by reducing the number of contacts that we have and breaking the chains of infection so that they can have an easier time over the festive, festive period. Uh, moving on then to comments from. Uh, Thank you, Minister, for giving way. And uh, forgive me, I should have came in a little bit quicker. It was just on the vaccination issue, and obviously I welcome the progress um, that the United Kingdom has made in being the first country in the world uh, to be rolling this out in Northern Ireland, benefiting from it. As we build up our resilience and protect the most vulnerable, clearly the cross-border dimension of travel from north to south has implications whilst the Republic of Ireland still hasn't started to roll out a vaccination programme. Is there any indication as to when the Republic of Ireland will be starting to carry out its vaccination? Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question. I, I can't give any, any firm update. It's not information that I have to hand. I do know the EMA, the European Medicines Advisory Board, is due to give its go-ahead for the Pfizer vaccine, I think, on the 29th of this month. So at that point then, I am assured, or will be. Assured, I, I, I hope, if that approval is given, the Republic of Ireland will then start its vaccination program using the Pfizer vaccine, or if any others come come to hand before that. Um, Ms. Hunter, as well, you know, in, in regards to, um, I suppose, following on from from our predecessor's role in the health committee, she has big shoes to fill. Um, but I want to thank Colin for his contribution over the last few months in regards to holding my department and my officials to account in a constructive way, which he's always done. Mm -hmm. And I hope that the member is able to follow on in, in, in that regard as well. But one thing she's already brought to this House is her, I think, her passion for mental health and how she has uh, presented that. Mr Deputy Speaker, I visited this morning staff at, at Hollywell Hospital 
in regards to just, I suppose, to, to show them our thanks and appreciation for the work that they have been doing over the past number of months, because they're often that front line that are already there that are are often forgot about when we think about mental health. We think of all the challenges that are present in the community and the GPs, but we often forget those who are actually staffing our mental health facilities on a full-time basis, supporting some of what are the most uh, vulnerable in our community. And it was, uh, it was an honour uh, and a an humble experience to see the work uh, that they're continuing to do day in, um, day out. In regards to Mr McGrath's comments, I think I, I, I covered that in regards to our, our, our assessment process. I, I would just caution him. I, I know he likes to use um, illustrative language in regards to hokey cokey. I, I don't think to lessen or to lighten the seriousness of this, this virus um, is the right thing to do. I'm not criticising for it, but I think we just need to be careful uh, around our words. Uh, in regards to Mrs Bradshaw's comments, in regards to what we saw at the weekend, in regards to face coverings, um, again, I would say I'm amazed. I was in shock by, by the things that I, that I saw in the Abbey Centre. I'm just challenged as to how um, the owner of the facility, the managers of the facilities, didn't have those structures in place. Because I'm reassured, you know, that the. the the retail engagement group that are that is headed up by the junior ministers, the engagement by the economy committee, uh, the work that has been done by our retail sector, that there would be things in place uh, to prevent us uh, following into what we had seen a few weeks earlier, when you know outside the same shop, only it was outside, mm -hmm. and the streets of Belfast wouldn't happen again. You know, so it is about taking on those responsibilities, and I think some of the some of the commentary in regards to how others saw that. Um, especially on social media over the weekend, actually just put into, I think, into stark reality in regards to how, how necessary are a pair, pair of pyjamas when it comes to you putting yourself or, or your family members uh, into that challenge, uh, challenging the situation. In regards to, to Mr. Mr Chambers' um, comments then as well, in regards to um, these restrictions, you know, we've fallen them at, at our own peril. I think was, was uh, Mr. Chambers actually wor actually actual words. I think one of the things, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is we ignore these restrictions at someone else's peril, because we ignore these restrictions at the, the ability or or the opportunity of someone else becoming infected and ended up in hospital. And that's some of the selfishness that I think we need to challenge. And I take on you know M Mr. Carl's comments certainly. Um, Minister, just recently the Chief Medical Officer, Dr Michael McBride, in a press conference in this building said that just because you can doesn't mean you should. Would the Minister agree that these words will carry a huge significance in coming days? You know, I do, and you know, always you know, coming from the advice of the Chief Medical Officer is something I take with great value and cognizance as well. You know, those words have resonated. And have been used by used by myself, and I think actually used by the first minister as well, because it is about that issue of, of self responsibility. You know, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Buckley's comments in regards to to what we can do, what we should do, and again in regards to not not a challenge to Mr. Carl, because I wouldn't do that, but just because the assembly has put relaxations in, or the executive has put relaxations into place. It's not about looking for someone to blame in the future. It's about enabling people to have their own uh, level of degree of sensibility and seriousness and observance as to what they can do, what they should do and what they shouldn't do. Because I think the concern was in regards to the establishment, especially in the guidance for over the Christmas period, was that if without a structure being there, people would simply revert to a free-for-all. Uh, in regards to how many people they could have in the house, so it is there as, as a framework that people could work for and work to, not that something that they actually have to have to abide by. In regard to, to Ms. Bailey's, uh, Claire Bailey's comments in regards to um, where we are and her, her criticism um, of the executive, I've said in this house many times it's not easy as a five-party executive coming with the different. Uh, political outlooks on many things um, that we do have, but one thing that I am assured of is the consistent message that has come from my department and the health and healthcare workforce 
across Northern Ireland. In fact, Mr. Principal, our Deputy Speaker, um, there's a statement that has been issued by the Chief Executives of all six health trusts um, earlier today in regards to their concern. That message, their message is consistent with anything that has come out from, from me as Health Minister, as the Chief Medical Officer or the Chief Scientific Advisor in regards to how dangerous this virus is, the how dangerous this virus uh, continues to be, and the steps that we can take uh, to break those chains um, of, of infection. Um, certainly. Um. Mrs Bailey also raised a very important issue of what is likely to happen on the 4th of January. Now, given his understanding of the situation and the advice that he's been given by the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer, what is his best educated guess as to where we will be as a province in the first Monday in January, as far as restrictions are concerned? Um, I was just about to come to that comment. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to say, but I was just about to come there. Uh, look, I, I, what I will say um, to the members, and, and with, all, with all respect, and they will know me well enough, the member, um, the member from South Down has himself, himself indicated um, the number of times I've come to this House, the number of times I've made myself available to the media. One thing that I've always done, Mr Deputy Speaker, is to have those conversations in the executive first and then communicate them out. It is challenging, and I said as well, you know, it's challenging that often when we're having those conversations within the executive, there's some in the media are able to put them up on Twitter before I've taken a note as to what we've actually agreed. Um, do, do I think we will be facing further restrictions before this year end or just towards the start of the new year? That's something that we will see and something that we'll assess over the next week in regards to how effective the two-week circuit breaker has been, or if it has had any effect at all. We can see how it has slowed the infection rate. We can see how it has, uh, I suppose, plateaued uh, the number of inpatients that we currently have, but it hasn't lessened uh, the pressures that we're currently seeing on our, our health and social care staff across the system. And that's one of the things, even going back to World Health Organization, um, guidance and advice in regards to when you utilize a circuit breaker is you use it to alleviate the pressure on your health care system. The member will know because he has um, sat in this seat of the pressures that we face anyway at this time of year, never mind um, in the middle of a pandemic with what could be a further wave. I thank the Minister for giving way and on the point of uh reinfection rates, etc., over the Christmas period. First of all, I know he would agree with me that personal responsibility would be paramount in that time. Uh, the government enter a contract with the people, uh, but it is the people that must exercise that restraint when it comes to the uh, restrictions that are in place at the moment. But in light of the, the, where the R rate is at the moment uh, and the developments and our knowledge now of test and trace, is the Minister able to elaborate to the House as to where the main sources of uh, infection rate are at present in relation to the R rate? I, I, I thank the Member. Look, one of the things he will be aware of, one of the, the changes that we made, one of the advancements we have made in our test, trace and protect system is that ability to look back. Um, so We started that on the 16th of November where we actually asked somebody um, who has tested positive where they have been over the last seven days rather than just the last 48 hours. So when we got the presentation from the Public Health Agency on Friday, myself, uh, the First and Deputy First Minister, actually visited our test, trace and protect um, offices in County Hall in Balamina. We were able to see further uh, guidance and information as to where those uh, outbreaks actually have been. So they did show a number of, of various settings, including churches, uh, gyms, retail sector as well. Um, but you know, it was all proportionate as to what time and where restrictions actually fell. So what we're actually doing, and the First and Deputy First Minister received the update that I did, is when we can validate that information to make it public, because one of the things we don't want to set out is set out a false sense of that information um, as to how useful it actually, well, how, how we present it uh, in a useful sort of way to, to the general public so that they can see the evidence of where outbreaks actually are occurring you know, in regards to to being related, related to school and to churches as well. But one thing, and, and I will say to, to Mr Alistair, he raised in regards to church, yes, we have churches and church settings. We have um, seen 
a number of outbreaks um, actually related to churches and church settings um, as well. So that's why there was a step uh, to introduce that two-week circuit break in regards to the churches and places of worship as a, as a specific location that hadn't been included before because it is coming through in our PHA system and not to put those church goers off or not to put them off in the engagement with our public health agency. One of the things that has come clearly through and it has been indicated before through, through these, the systems that we have, um, trying to think Mr Deputy Speaker how I put this sensitively but also politically correctly, uh, when a contact tracer contacts someone who has been at church in the past seven days, someone who has been at church is more likely to say they have been in church, if the member gets my drift. So there is an indication then in regards to contact tracers where they're engaging. There is an openness and an, an, openness and an honesty there that seems to be confirming that going to church may in fact do you some good. I would wholeheartedly agree with the member, because I've never met anyone that has done them any harm. Although there may be some in this house who could benefit greatly from actually listening when they were there. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I think in regards to, to, to the comments, I hope that sort of clarifies some of the reason why that two, two, sort of, uh, why that two week was there. In regards to, to the face coverings, um, I suppose one of, one of the challenges... Certainly. Thank you, Minister. Minister, I know of people, there's going to be a mass shift of people trying to come home for Christmas, and people have come from other countries um, and they're travelling in here. I know of other people who are going to have to be tested in the country that they're in, be tested clear, and get a certificate before being allowed to travel. So, are we, when they arrive here, going to be, you know, under this test and trace and, and the track system, are we going to be looking at those certificates? Are we going to be asking people upon entry? And are we going to be testing people who are leaving here to travel elsewhere? Um, I'll thank the member. I'll, I'll come back to her when it was in, in regards to, to Mr. Allister's contribution. He did ask. In regards specifically to the face coverings, one of the things that has been brought forward, and again, it's through international um, advice and, and looking at other practices in regards to ch church outbreaks, and that's in regards to singing uh, and the, the aerosol that's generated through singing as well. So that's why the, the advice that has been brought forward uh, in other places that we've adopted ourselves is regarded as a better management tool. Uh, that those face coverings are used all the time, rather than having to take them on and put face coverings on and off. So, for the sake of, I suppose, for the sake of the hour that somebody's in church, to try and minimise not just the risk, but to allow churches to go ahead uh, with their services as much as possible. No, if a member had attended a Baptist or a Free Presbyterian church, it certainly would not be an hour. It's more likely to be two hours. So therefore, it is a bit of an inconvenience to have to wear a mask throughout that. I don't know what church he attends, but if he's only going, getting an hour, then he's been very short-changed. I, I, I will con and, and, and we often wonder, Mr Deputy Speaker, why there are so many Protestant denominations in Northern Ireland. Um, what, what I will say to the member, as a Presbyterian, um, if you can't get three points into a sermon in an hour, uh, there's something, well, sorry, I'll not go any farther than that. So I'm probably in enough trouble at this point in time. Um, so in regards, I'll maybe not answer the members, all, all, the, all the, the members' concerns as well, but it is, there is an engagement piece that the junior ministers uh, lead up in regards to the leaders of, of our main churches as well, in regards to, to the engagement that they have. And I, I, from, from feedback that I've had, I think the junior ministers uh, fully understand the, the, the passion and the feeling within the main church leaders after that decision uh, was made. But the member will know it's not something that I make easier, not a recommendation that I bring forward easily either. In regards to, to travel, uh, Ms Bailey, um, we are and we, and we do have our regulations set up into international travel depending on what country you come from uh, rather than the test, test on arrival. Um, one of the things that we haven't done yet, although we, are, we have explored it and we are looking at it, is the commercial nature of then testing on arrival because of those who can afford to fly paying for their own tests or because you can afford to fly, you actually get priority or access uh, to the National Health Service testing, which is not something uh, that would sit comfortably with me. So that's why we've maintained and followed the route of assessing the country of 
you're travelling from assessing the risk there, and then depending on that, on where we deem necessary, should you be following 10 days um, isolation or not? So that's done on an international basis. It's done by the JBCI, and though that country analysis is used as the same across the four nations um, as well. I know that the travel sector have um, been greatly hit by um, the, the pandemic, but in both London, Dublin and in other places, you can now, whenever you return, isolate for five days and get a test and then release. Would you have any indication as to when that system might be brought in here, uh, as it may unlock uh, at some point in the future, um, whenever we're over the worst of this and there's still some restrictions? It may uh, open some routes and may help the travel industry who are feeling at this stage that they have been left behind somewhat. No, as I've, I've said, it is something we are, we are observing because it has just recently started um, in England as well. But as it's a commercial transaction, then it's not, our, it's, it's not the National Health Service, either Pillar 1 or Pillar 2, that is used for testing that. So it is a commercial transaction that will be used. And there is just a concern. I, we would have a concern. I would have a concern that we start to use up testing capacity for what is a commercial transaction rather than a health nature as well. So it's something that we do, do maintain. Um, maintain an eye on and, and keep an eye on. Um, Mr Pre Deputy Speaker, I think I've, I've covered most concerns. Uh, Mr. 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 Uh, does the Minister know uh, when we will be discussing these latest regulations that are in place and, if required, um, early in the new year, if cases go up, uh, would he and his department be uh, willing to reconvene the Assembly for discussing? Uh, I think the worst possible thing would be, um, while people deserve a break, uh, this place being closed if we have a massive increased spike in, in cases. So, is there any, any view or any consideration of that uh, point? Thank you. In regards to bringing forward recommendations, I have never been reluctant or hesitant in bringing forward uh, recommendations to the executive. In regards to the seriousness in recalling this House, in regards to assessing um, further restrictions or, or regulations that needed to be brought in, I leave that in the hands of the Speaker and members. There are uh, in standing orders, there is a call of 30 members that can recall the House, or I think it is in the gift of the First and Deputy First Minister. I do not think it is in the gift. Um, uh, the, the Minister is quite correct in the, the process he outlines. On the business committee who sets the, the, the work of the Assembly or the business of the Assembly already has taken that into consideration and have and are aware and, and are prepared to recall the Assembly if need be for any matter of business that rises over the break. I, I thank the member for, from the business committee for that clarity. Um, as, as I was about to Say I, don't, I think the ad hoc committee, the COVID ad hoc committee, Mr. Deputy Speaker, still has the, the facility to do that. So that the member will know, um, if need be, I will do that. But I think we're going to give the commitment as well. If we have to provide written statements, we'll do that as well to make sure members are kept as fully up to date as, as we possibly can. Uh, Just as a follow-up, uh, Minister, to, to John O'Dowd's question earlier, have we concern around the? <clears throat> The rollout of the vaccination there, you'd said there's 1,700 done over a seven day period. The first uh, delivery of 25,000 vaccines, I presume, will do 12,500 people, given it's a split dose. At that rate, you'd be looking at some six weeks. So I presume that there is significant scaling up. How long do you expect it to take to do the first 12,500 vaccines? And what else I'll say to the member, don't. don't um, in regards to Mr. O'Dowd's answer I gave as well, what we were doing at the start was making sure the logistics, because you do remember um, this, this vaccine itself presented severe logistical challenges as well, because it had to be stored at minus 70. It came in the batches of 1,000, so we had to work out how to split that down. We were the first part of the United Kingdom to actually get into care homes. Uh, so as our plan to do the, the, the first batch, um, we would hope, uh, and I say it, it's a hope and a plan at this minute in time, to be able to do the entirety of our care home sector uh, and residents in it at least once um, by the end of this year. So that's a major logistical challenge in itself. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask the member not to, not to just take what we've done in the past few days, because that was about setting up systems, processes, and making sure our vaccinators uh, were vaccinated first. So first, I, I suppose the first main day of vaccination was today, so we'll be able to look and get the assessment from today, tomorrow, and then we'll be able to update it sooner rather than later in regards to how we're, how we're progressing with that. The, the initial batch, as I said, to, you know, in, in response to the Deputy Chair, we now have 50,000 vaccines in place. Uh, we are hopeful there will become 
more available towards the towards the end of the year as well. So that supply line will continue to to produce. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I think that's um, everyone that that has uh, raised any queries or comments. I, I will say, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there was challenges at the start about the usefulness um, of this debate, of this time in the chamber. But I think in the engagement um, that we've had in the past period of time, I think there have been members who have been able to raise questions, hopefully get some answers or some indication. Maybe not something that they, maybe not to the detail that they would have liked. Um, but in closing, I would say we all have a responsibility to help curb the spread of the virus. We do that, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, I'll repeat it, maintaining social distancing, maintaining good hand and respiratory hygiene, wearing face coverings, self-isolating immediately if we experience any symptoms, including a new persistent cough, a fever or a loss of change of smell or taste, uh, seeking a test if we experience any of these symptoms, downloading the Stop COVID NI app and complying with the restrictions that are in place. Mr Deputy Speaker, by following this advice as we go about our da daily lives, we can protect ourselves and others from serious illness, protect our health service and our economy, and help avoid further prolonged and more stringent restrictions. Mr D Deputy Speaker, I beg to move. I would firstly like to confirm that the Ad Hoc Committee uh, can meet if a minister informs the Speaker that they wish to bring a statement to an ad hoc committee. So that is still uh, within our provisions to or arrange shortly uh, and possibly, who knows, within the next number of weeks if there is a need. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Number 2, Amendment Number 17, Regulations NI 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The eyes have it. We will now move on to the second motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. I will ask the Clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 18, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. And I would call the Minister to formally move the motion. Moved. Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 18, Regulations NI 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments.